Thank you very much, Bill, for that very generous introduction. First of all, as uh, CEO of the Wellcome Trust Genome Campus and Director of Sanger, I'd like to welcome you all here. The campus is, has 1,500 scientists on it at the moment, and with the new building, the EBI South building that you saw at the entrance, it'll have 1,700. That makes it the biggest um, aggregation of scientists in genomics and biodata probably in the world. Currently, there is no space on the campus really for the development of businesses, but we're considering what we can do in the future on that score, particularly around biodata. So I'm going to talk about some of the applications of genomic uh, information with respect to medicine. And after the sequencing of the human genome and other genomes, pathogen genomes, the transformative change was the development of a set of technologies which came online in about 2007, which changed the cost of sequencing DNA and changed the speed of sequencing DNA. And you can see here on this uh, exponential axis that there was a dramatic drop in the cost of DNA sequencing such that over the last 15 years, it's cost a million times less per base than it did 15 years ago. Alongside that, of course, this is Moore's law, the reduction in the costs of storing that data, and that provides us with our greatest strategic issue. A number of different technologies have contributed to this drop. This actually has slightly leveled off over the last couple of years. We have learned here not to try and predict what's going to happen in DNA sequencing in the next few years. Early on, we thought that the companies were being much too aggressive in their prediction of how much the DNA sequencing costs were going to drop, and we were completely wrong. It was much better, a much better change in costs than we expected. More recently, learning from our mistakes, we said, well, we're going to be less conservative and predict a much greater drop in costs, and we were wrong again. It leveled off. So we don't know what's going to happen, but almost certainly this is going to drop, and we're going to have all sorts of different types of sequencing technologies, sequencing technologies that will do huge amounts in facilities like Sanger, sequencing technologies that probably will be handheld to be doing sequencing in the field. So where do they take us? They allow us to investigate sequence variation in a variety of contexts. That can be looking at sequence variation between human beings. It can be at looking at sequence variation between cancers and the normal uh, DNA of those individuals. And it can be looking at sequence differences between isolates of pathogenic organisms. These are the three areas in which we think DNA sequencing and that huge acceleration that has taken place is going to have impact, or already has had impact, in human health and is going to be a driver, an engine for further translation in the next few years. What can you do with the information that is extracted from those three contexts? You can make diagnoses. For example, what is the, is there a genetic basis to this child's cleft lip? If so, which gene is it? And if so, will other children in the family get that mutation? We can understand biology. This was always a rather hand-waving aspect of genomics, but there are several examples now that by knowing mutations, whether it's mutations in bugs or in cancer, that has provided us insights into biology, which have led to drug targets, which have led to drugs that work. This is no longer a fantasy. It leads us, if we have drugs, to prediction. Predictions if one is a child with diabetes as to whether one's going to respond to insulin or to the sorts of drugs that are taken by adults with late onset diabetes. Predictions from cancers as to whether an individual cancer is going to respond to a particular targeted therapy or not. And predictions for pathogenic <coughs> microorganisms as to whether they're going to be resistant or not vaccine responsive or not. And finally, it can tell us about the origin of the DNA. So we're very familiar with uh, paternity testing, knowing that a child is going to share 50% of its his or her DNA with the parent. And we know that that was applied to forensics for many years. We can now apply exactly the same principles for following pathogenic microorganisms as they go across the world. We can do exactly the same principles in thinking about DNA that's circulating in the body. If it has the features of cancer DNA, it can serve as a marker of tumor burden. 
So these are the four areas in which we can extract knowledge using DNA sequences. And I'm going to give you two instances, two examples of what has been done recently and where we're thinking the field is going to go and some of the challenges that are going to confront us as we try and implement this revolution of information optimally. So the first is using genome sequences of pathogenic microorganisms in public health management of infectious disease. This is um, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. This is a small organism with a genome of 4 million bases. That's about a thousand-fold smaller than the human genome. That means it's possible to sequence hundreds, thousands of these organisms relatively straightforwardly. And when we do that, we can take one strain and find that sequence. And if we take the sec a second strain of the same bug, we find that there's a sequence difference between them. So we can code this in this uh, cartoon depiction that here are two different strains and they differ from each other substantially in terms of their genomes. Still Staph aureus, but they differ. And then we can think of how we implement that in a special care baby unit. A special care baby unit which has suffered an outbreak of MRSA, as shown here. Knowing what you can see up on the slide at the moment just tells you that there are a lot of children infected with MRSA. It doesn't tell you whether this is an outbreak starting from one individual or whether there were several entries of MRSA into the uh, SCBU. However, if we sequence them and we see that they're all different colors, in other words, they are rather different from each other, there's a lot of sequence differences between them, that would suggest that this so-called outbreak was due to multiple different entries of the bug into the intensive care unit. On the other hand, if they all look very similar, this is an outbreak starting from one source. And that's the sort of information that has very different implications for um, control of infection. And we can take that further, and it has been taken further, as I'll show you in a moment, to now look at the parents, the workers in the ward, workers elsewhere in the hospital, and we can find which ones of those are carrying MRSA, and then we can sequence their genomes, and we find that many of them look different, but this one looks similar, and this individual potentially is the culprit who is bringing that bug into the intensive care unit. So these are really transformative technologies which have real examples now. So this was from Addenbrooks, um, the hospital infection control team identified 12 children colonized with MRSA. The MRSA sequencing confirmed that this was an outbreak starting from one source. Expe extending that to other members, to work people working in the unit, to the parents, showed there were 26 cases of carriage of the same strain, showing that this bug was being transmitted on the infectious care, on, on the um, ITU, between mothers on the postnatal ward and in the community. And it showed that MRSA carriage by a staff member had allowed the outbreak to persist. So, all of a sudden, the anatomy of outbreaks over weeks, months, and years has been transformed by genome sequencing, allowing implementation of measures which otherwise would not have been used. The cost of this is really, even at the moment, is reasonable. Even at these early stages of implementation, about 100 quid per MRSA isolate, which if you have to sequence 100, 200 isolates, is still better than the costs of containing an outbreak. So this is technology which is, can be used on the scale of an outbreak in a hospital. It can be used on the scale of monitoring an outbreak across the country. This is the flu epidemic of UK of 2009. Here is a phylogenetic tree with hundreds of sequences of influenza viruses put onto the tree, certain clades colored in pink. These are the parts of the tree that entered the UK, so you can see there were multiple entries of influenza into the UK for this epidemic. Most of them died out, but these two continued, contributing to the second wave. So that's the UK monitoring public health understanding of what the epidemic was. And we can now look more to the future to think about how can we 
monitor, how can we survey pathogen populations for the foreseeable future? So this is the world, and this is how cholera has spread from the Bay of Bengal. But we can imagine continuing to, to monitor cholera for the foreseeable future and all other bugs of this nature to get a sense of what is happening to populations of pathogens across the world. Where are resistant clones emerging? Where are vaccine-resistant clones emerging? So this is all fine. This is a vision of the future. To do this, you're going to need some ma major aggregation of data, sequence data in one place associated with knowledge, metadata about those sequences, and that database is going to have to be maintained, sustained forever. And the challenge that we all need to consider, that's those of us in academia, those of us in government, those of us in health services, and those of us in business, is how are we going to provide for sustainable databases that will provide these functions forever? So the second example I'll give you of how we're thinking that the usage of genomic sequences will take us in future is with cancer. And we've already heard some aspects of this from Susan Galbraith. Why should we want to know whether a, a particular patient should get one drug rather than another drug? Well, for the patient, it means that they will receive an effective drug rather than an ineffective drug. If we can predict that um, most effective therapy for the health provider, it reduces the cost of providing of prescribing ineffective drugs, and for the pharmaceutical company, if they could know what the subpopulation was going to be responsive to the drug, it would increase the likelihood of approval. So in principle, all involved should have a vested interest in making this work. This is how it happens, more or less, at the moment in clinical practice. Here we have a doctor trying to work out what is the best therapy to give his patient. The patient has breast cancer, and the doctor is thinking of a clinical trial. So breast cancer isn't one disease. It's actually already been divided into a number of different diseases. If it has this marker expressed, estrogen receptor, then more or less one will give drug A. If this marker is present, HER2, with amplification of the HER2 gene, then this drug could be prescribed, and if neither of them are present, then there will be a third drug or set of drugs that can be prescribed. So that is the setup that the doctor is thinking about. This is what he is doing. He's looking into the literature, clinical trial results that have said these drugs work with these types of subtypes of breast cancer. The trouble is, the challenge and the opportunity is there you've got two markers, the estrogen receptor and the HER2, and we are confronted with the possibility that there is going to be an explosion of genomic information with lots of features of the genome, mutated cancer genes or other features of the genome, which could impact, which could influence the responsiveness of an individual cancer to a drug. Moreover, in the previous slide, I showed it as three different drugs or classes of drugs that could be used. But potentially, because of the um, effect that genome sequencing has had from, on cancers of producing so many new potential targets, we are likely to see a flow of many more drugs that could be used in um, oncology. So instead of having a choice of three, we may have a choice of 10 or more, if we're lucky. So we are confronted by an explosion of genomic information, which is going to give us many more potential predictors of how a patient's um, cancer will respond, and many more potentially drugs that could be choices for us. So the first challenge that we might have is what clinical trials should we do to test that particular a, a, the, a drug? Well, we have a choice of 100 cancer types, and let's say from the genome we extract what are the mutated cancer genes. There are hundreds of those. So we don't know, in the first instance, really, which cancer we should be treating in the first trial of a particular drug. And then we have potentially many drugs with that choice. So one of the ways that we have tried in order to give insight, it's only insight, it's not really direction, is to have a preclinical in vitro phase of drug testing, which many of the pharmaceutical companies, including AstraZeneca, 
and many others have given us their early stage compounds, CRUK similarly. Several hundred of these have been run on a set of 1,000 genomically characterized cancer cell lines. So these are across all types of cancer. We've sequenced their exomes. We've sequenced their transcriptomes. We've done their epigenomes. So we have a number of genomic markers which should allow us to predict which subset of these cancers will be responsive to one of the 500 or more drugs that have been run. And this is the sort of data that we produce. All that this shows you is that each of these is a subset of the lines which has a particular mutated cancer gene and that that subset has been treated with a particular drug. Where it's green, it means that that mutated gene is conferring sensitivity to that drug as opposed to the rest of the cancer cell lines. And where it's red, that mutated gene is causing resistance to the drug compared to the remainder of the cancer cell lines. And the point about this, the message to convey, is the number of green and red circles. Because what it's telling us, there's huge richness of information in the genome predicting response to almost all drugs. So out of 68 mutated cancer genes we were looking at here, 64 of them influence the response of at least one of the drugs we've tested. And we, by this freeze of the data, we tested 130 drugs, and 115 of them were affected in their sensitivity by at least one mutated cancer gene. So there is a huge number of these interactions, a huge amount of data to be extracted and to be used. So that's what we could possibly use for um, helping design initial clinical trials. But of course, when we're thinking back to what we can do with the patients, we can't use that in vitro data. We need, to have, we need to inform the choice of drug in the future on the basis of the experience of other patients who've been treated with the drug. So here I'll turn to illustrate the complexity of what we may be seeing to another example. Um, Susan Galbraith talked about EGF receptor. This is BRAF, mutations of which are found in 70% of malignant melanoma. A, on the basis of that, an inhibitor of BRAF was... Um, designed, was uh, extracted, and that was shown to be effective in clinical trials. So that's a patient with metastatic malignant melanoma with a BRAF mutation, and 15 days later the PET scan goes cold. So if we now think about that doctor treating a patient with malignant melanoma, which was one disease with basically one set of drugs, now, if, the, if this malignant melanoma is positive for BRAF, it's got a BRAF mutation, you will give vemurafenib, the drug that was shown on the previous slide, or one of the others that have come along. If it's negative, you don't give that drug. Well, that's fairly simple clinical decision-making, and clinical trials can be designed to show that. So that's fairly standard. Now, we can consider the mutation... So there's this very common mutation in BRAF, and if that mutation is present, then the cancer will respond to the drug. However, if it's one of the other mutations in, in BRAF, the chances are it won't respond. So we're now introducing an extra little bit level of complexity. It's still comprehensible, but we need to understand both the mutator gene and the mutation in the gene, because both of them influence the response. And then there are other genes that turn out to be mutated in melanoma, and they would predict different drugs. And if we now switch from melanoma, so we switch the cancer type to colorectal cancer, and we look at that same mutation, which conferred sensitivity in malignant melanoma, on its own, it no longer confers sensitivity to the drug. In order to make a colorectal cancer respond, you have to give that drug and another drug. So we can see that we are encountering increasing levels of complexity. We only need to go a little bit further from this, and we're going to start getting to levels of complexity where the individual clinician will not be able to make the decision for himself or herself. How great is this complexity? Well, I'll show you some further indication from the studies done here. In this case, in myelodysplastic syndrome, this is a cancer gene that is mutated in myelodysplastic syndrome. What you see here is uh, survival curves 
for individuals who, are, who do not have a mutation in this gene in purple and individuals who do have a mutation in this gene in green. So clearly, having a mutation in this gene affects outcome. It's not quite predicting drug response, but nevertheless, outcome. So that's one of the mutated cancer genes you find in this cancer. These are some of the remaining, the other mutated cancer genes, and the ones I've ringed are all statistically significant predictions of outcome on the basis of the presence of a mutated cancer gene in this one disease. So there are many predictors, independent, and you can see they're not so simple because here, for this gene, not having the mutation gives you a better chance of surviving than having the mutation. For this one, having the mutation gives you a better chance of survival than not having the mutation. So there is tremendous complexity which we're going to have to capture. So if we're going to have to include cancer type, variety of different genes, hundreds of genes, particular mutations, and then we layer on all sorts of other biodata into this, it becomes very difficult for this clinician to make the decision. It becomes even more difficult if there are if there's a pipeline of drugs comes to fruition and there are many more drugs and then there are combinations. So how are we going to address this problem? This problem is going to have to be addressed computationally. We're going to have to somehow predict decision support for that clinician which is the right drug to give. For that, we're going to need to have data. And that data is all data. It's not just the genomics data. We're entering an age of information. We need to have as much data as we can get our hands on about that individual patient and their cancer. All these things relating to the drugs in which they've been treated. And the key about this database, it has to be big. It trips off the tongue, but unless we have a million patients in such a database, we are not going to have the statistical power to see all the predictions. So we will need a large database of this nature, and on top of that, we will need algorithms which will extract the associations between mutations or anything else and response to drugs, compute them, and will then give that clinician some sort of prediction of how many extra or fewer weeks of life that particular patient may get. That's the vision we will have for the future. How do we get there? So those are the components of such a thing based on information. So who are the, going to be the patients in this database? We need a lot of them. It cannot just be patients from clinical trials. It will need to be large numbers of patients who are being routinely treated with um, anti-cancer drugs. Ideally, we always speak of it, we are in a very position in this country because we have this one encompassing structure of the NHS with large numbers of patients with cancer being treated and an information structure to be extracted from them. So we have a fantastic opportunity in this, in this country to build that database. <laughs> However, although it's a good opportunity, it's not actually so much better than what might exist in certain sectors in the US. And the, but more importantly, unless we actively do something about this, it won't just happen. This is a huge piece of work. It's a huge piece of work in many ways. It has to be long-term. It has to be sustainable. And the question comes, who is going to pay for the creation of that long-term sustainable database? And by that, I'm not meaning the data distributed all over the NHS, but brought together, aggregated into a working database. This is a huge task, a very expensive one. Is the NHS going to do it? Are the research organizations, the charities, who usually are the people who are funding databases at the moment, are they going to take this on sustainably for the future? Or is there going to have to be a commercial solution? And if there is going to be a commercial solution, what is the business model for that? Can one take out IP on discoveries of association between a mutated gene and response to a drug? Is one going to have to hold some data private in order to um, encourage investment and to give an advantage to the organization? Or is it simply going to be um, organization and presentation of data and predictions as a kind of pay-per-view service? None of this really has been worked out. But unless we think it all through, we are going to miss this opportunity in front of us. And the other thing that we're going to confront is the issue of, of regulation. It's not going to be possible for us to test in a clinical trial in a prospective manner 